All right, so I'm grateful to be able to bring God's Word to you guys today. I'm excited that you guys are here. Um, So today we're going to be talking about Paul some more. And I know we talked about Paul last time. Last time you learned about Paul and how he preached uh, preached to the Athenians. And he preached in Athens talking about the unknown God. So since then... An entire 10 chapters have passed, and what has happened in those chapters is a lot. And we're going to look today at chapter 27, but before you turn there, I want you to turn to Acts 23, because we're going to look at something there before we get to our main passage. But what's been happening is Paul has been preaching to the Gentiles. He's been teaching the Gentiles the truth of the gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ, And as he's been doing this, people have been getting upset. Jewish leaders have been getting upset because they're saying he's preaching things that are against what we believe. He is preaching salvation by grace while we believe it is salvation according to our customs and according to our laws. And so he stirs up some anger and he ends up getting arrested. He gets arrested and is put on trial and goes to these various councils goes to these governors, goes to all these places where they're trying to figure out whether he is worthy of execution or punishment in these various ways. So these Jewish leaders are angry at them, and these Jews are angry at Paul. And it even gets to a point where the Jews are so upset that they're trying to kill them, kill Paul, and the Romans actually protect him. And that's what we're going to see really quick in chapter 23, because this is going to set up for our whole passage in chapter 27. So Acts 23, look at verse 11. So this was right after he stood before a council, and these Jews were trying to kill him because they were so upset. The following night, verse 11, the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify about them in Rome. So what's that saying? That's saying, Paul, you have testified about me to the Gentiles. You have testified all over, but you are going to Rome. You are not going to die now. You're going to make it to Rome, and I'm promising that you will make it to Rome and testify about me. So this is a promise to Paul in this moment where people are trying to kill him. God is promising you will testify about me in Rome. So now, and I want us to remember, that's going to be the theme of our passage, and you can turn to Acts 27 now. But the theme of this passage today is going to be God's promise. God's promise. Can you guys say God's promise? God's promise. So that's going to be our theme today. Now we're going to see whether Paul truly trusts God's promise even when the trials come. So Paul begins venturing off to Rome. He's with a Roman soldier, and they are taking him to Rome to stand trial before Caesar. And we're going to see a little bit. I want to show you guys a map of exactly where Paul is going as we're coming into this passage today. So he leaves from Caesarea, which is down there, and he's going up. This is all um, a map of the Mediterranean Sea, and you see him going up all the way to Myra and then down to Lazier, and that's what is seen in the first eight verses of this chapter, of chapter 27, and he's going up and he gets to the island of Crete, and he's at Fair Havens right there, and then you see to the left is Phoenix, and so I want you guys to remember Phoenix because we're going to look right now exactly why that's important. So look with me at verse 9. Verse 9, since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and of the ship, but also our lives. So Paul's saying, we should not travel now to Phoenix. We're in fair havens, but we shouldn't travel. We need to stay here because it's getting to the stormy season. The stormy season is coming and it would be dangerous to go. So Paul's saying, no, we shouldn't go. He's been in three shipwrecks at this point. He has a little bit of this knowledge. But then we'll see, verse 11, but the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the major- in, in, to spend the, winter in the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix. So they're saying, we're going to go to Phoenix. We know it's bad weather. It's a short little trip. It's just across the island. We're going to travel close along the shore, and we're going to get there. 
And here is where God's promise comes to be tested for Paul. Is Paul going to have faith that God's promise is true? Because now I want you guys to look at verse 13. And we're going to see something happen. Verse 13. Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that, it had, that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way, we gave way to it and were driven along. So they're caught in this storm. In this little travel to Phoenix, they're caught in this storm. And they don't know what's happening. It starts to become incredibly tempestuous. They're off course. They're throwing off cargo because they're realizing we need to lighten the ship. They're strapping the ship together to keep it together because they're worried we're going to sink. They can't see the stars. They don't know where they are. They don't know how far from land they are. They have no clue where they are. They are driven out to sea. Many days go by and they don't know how many. And I want us to look at verse 20 after all this happens, all this craziness, and they're still in it. But verse 20 says, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. So these people, it says later that there were 276 people on this boat. They're losing hope. They don't know where they are. They know they're in the middle of the sea. They have no hope of what they are going to do. And I want you guys to now look at Paul. We're going to look at Paul. We see the attitude of the people, that there is no hope. But where is Paul's hope in all of this? Paul's hope, verse 21. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and have not set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. And then here we go, verse 22. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. This is a crazy thing to say in this time when these people are in a storm, their ship is barely being hold, held together, they don't know where they are, they're running out of food, and Paul says, not one of you will die. Not one of you will pass away. Verse 23 tells us exactly why. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. So this is a reminder of the promise back in Acts 23, right? It's a reminder that God will be faithful. God will keep his promise. He's made this promise that Paul will go to Rome and he's reminding him. And then the second part of verse 24, and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. God not only made this promise and was reminding Paul, I will be faithful. You will make it to Rome. But he's saying now, he's adding on to this promise and saying, every person on board here will live. Every person will make it through this storm. Paul's faith is incredible because that's hard to believe. That's difficult to believe when you're in the middle of a trial like that and remembering God is faithful in all of that. Paul lives with a confidence that God keeps his promises. Put that down for point number one. Live with confidence that God keeps his promises. Live with confidence that God keeps his promises. Now we're going to see, we see here that God gave two promises right there. And what I want us to see next is in verse 25. And I know you guys are writing down notes, so I'll just read it. Verse 25, right after he gives these two promises, he said, this is the reason why Paul has such faith. So Paul lives with confidence that God keeps his promises. Why? Why does he live with such confidence? And that's what I want to show you guys. Verse 25. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. He has faith that exactly what God says to the T, to the dot, will come true. He has faith in a God who is faithful. That is where his faith comes from. That's where his confidence comes to live in such a way that he is trusting God. 
He does this because he knows who God is. He, his faith is being directed at something. It's being directed at God because God is faithful. It's being directed at the character of God. And this is the focus of the whole Bible. We see this over and over and over throughout the Bible, looking at the nation of Israel, how God was faithful to always come back to them, to pull them back to him. He was faithful throughout that. He was faithful in the promise of the Messiah and the fulfillment of that in Jesus Christ. He's faithful to forgive. That's a promise he's given. If we seek him, if we call upon the name of the Lord, he will forgive. These are promises that we can bank on and we must trust these promises. God is faithful to keep his promises. Do you believe that? Do you truly believe that God is faithful? When you're reading the Bible with your parents or by yourself and you're reading about the, the truths and the promises of God, do you believe that those are true? Do you believe that those are things that God will bring to pass? I know many of you are young, but trials will come. When those trials come, are you guys ready to trust the Lord, to trust his promises? And I want to talk about two ways that we see Paul and how he is ex exemplifying faith and how we can learn from that of how do we grow in a faith for God. How do we grow in a faith for God? And you can put this down for point A, seek to be born again. Seek to be born again. This is so necessary to growing in a faith in God because this is the initial faith in God. If we believe in God, trust his promises that he will forgive our sins, he will save us. We must seek to be born again for this to come to pass. Turn with me to 1 John 5. 1 John 5, that'll be the, to the right in your Bibles, and it'll be just past, it's a little small book, just past James and First and Second Peter. And we're going to look at chapter 5. And I just want us to look at two verses here, because this is really important for remembering how do we grow in faith, starting with seeking to be born again. Chapter 5, verse 4. If you're not there yet, just listen along. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Paul is in this place where he's overcoming the world, but why? How is he overcoming the world? Because he has faith in God's promises, but where does that come from? It says, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Everyone who has been born of God. You must be born again. You must be born of God to have the faith that Paul has in God's promises. We must be born of him. We must be made new. Because only through that can we overcome the world. And only by our faith in God and his faithfulness are we able to have this kind of faith that Paul has. If we are to live in such a way of Paul, as Paul, you must become a new creation. You must turn from your sin. You must die to self. Die to yourself. Die to your sin. Leave that sin behind you. Turn to God who is so much greater. God is so worthy to be praised, so worthy of our worship. We must turn from our sin and we must throw ourselves into God. We must believe in him. We must believe that God came unto human flesh, lived a perfect life through the person of Jesus Christ, lived a perfect life, died, paid the price for our sins so that we may live. But he just calls us to repent and believe. I encourage you all to do that this morning. Repent and believe in Christ. Another way that we see Paul... Um, or another way that we can grow in a faith... Grow in a faith. We need to seek to be born again... But letter B, practice faith like Paul. Practice faith like Paul. This is important because we're going to see Paul practice faith throughout the whole rest of this story. So they're in, and you can turn back after you write that point down to Acts 27. So we're in this place where they're still in this storm. And Paul said, God's made these promises. I believe them to be true. I believe these promises will come to pass. And we're going to look over and over, and we will see how Paul's faith is exercised through this time. 
practice faith like Paul. All right, look with me in verse 27 through 32, and we're going to skip a little bit through the end of this, but we're going to get an image of how God's starting to fulfill the promise, and then we're also going to see how God is, tr- or how Paul is trusting God to fulfill this promise. So look with me at verse 27. When the 14th night has come, so this is two weeks into this, when the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. This is just them taking a measurement of how deep the water is, and they can tell that it's getting shorter and shorter. They say 20 fathoms. A little farther on, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. So they're getting close to land. Verse 30, And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. Paul is speaking with such authority to these centurions who are taking care of Paul because Paul is a prisoner of them, going to Rome. And Paul is speaking in such a way to these centurions that they hear that. And why does Paul have such authority in this? Because he trusts the promises of God. He's saying, you guys need to trust the promises of God. You guys need to stay in the boat. They need to keep out. You need to not let these people leave because we need to trust that God will be faithful, not by our own efforts, but by his. He knows God's promises to be true, So he lives like it and speaks as such. Another example, verse 34, a little further down. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. For not a hair is to perish from your head, from the head of any of you. He's saying no one will die. No hair of your head will perish. It's just another example of his confidence in God's promises. Verse 38, look with me there. Verse 38 And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. This is a huge step of faith because they're at this place where it's still dark and they don't really know how close they are to land, but they eat a meal and they trust God so fully that we're going to lighten the ship and get rid of this food. I'm trusting that God will save us, that we do not need to put our treasures in this food and what he's given us. I'm trusting that he will save us. And so they trust God in that and lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. Paul, time after time, practices his faith so clearly. He practices it, and I encourage all of you to practice your faith in the little things. Because only when we practice our faith in the little things, trusting that God, only when we practice our faith in, a little, in the little things can we grow to trust God in the big things. We must start by trusting him, trusting him at his word, trusting that his word is true, trusting the promises in it, trusting our parents that they know what's best for us because God has put them there for a reason. And only then can we grow to trust God how Paul did in this shipwreck. So we're going to read now how it ends, how God fulfilled his promises. He gave two promises. He said, Paul, you're going to Rome. And he said, no one on this ship will die. We're going to see exactly how he did it. So read with me verse 39, and we're going to read all the way to the end of the chapter. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach. So they see the land on which they had planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudder. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. So they ran into the surf, and the ship is stuck here now, and they're not quite close to land yet. Verse 42, the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. God's promises were fulfilled. These promises that seemed impossible were fulfilled. And, they tr- and Paul trusted God that it would be true. 
When God promises something, we must live as it is already so. That is faith. Trust God fully in everything. So what's the point of this whole passage? Why did God cause this trial? They still got to Rome. Why did he cause the trial? And I want us to think on Romans 8.28. This is a promise of God. This is a promise from his scripture. And I want you guys to remember this. Romans 8.28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. We must trust the promise that God can use all things for his glory and our good. He used this time with Paul to grow him. I'm sure that Paul even shared the truth of the gospel to these people on this ship. And they understood the faith that he had and were inspired by that. We must seek to trust God's promises. God can work all things together for good. Paul trusted this. Do you? Let's pray. Father God, as we meditate on your promises, God, looking at your work in Paul's life, um, Lord, I pray that we would trust your promises, that we would read about them, that we would know them, that they would be written on our heart, God, that we would trust them. Um, I pray even for small groups in this time, God, that as um, these kids, God, meditate on the truth of your word here in Acts 27, I pray that it would affect them, God, that they would know it, um, and God, they would come to recognize the importance of trusting your promises. So God, I pray for the rest of this day. I thank you that we get to come here and worship, and I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.